Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martin Hagvall, and I'm a member of the organizing committee for uh, the conference with the Sweden Game Arena. And I'm also a lecturer at the University of Kovde. And I have the great honor and the privilege today to introduce Ellen Beeman, someone whose work I have admired for some time. Uh, an author, television screenwriter, and of course, a game developer and producer. The list of her accomplishments and, uh, and achievements is far too, too great to enumerate here. It includes her work in the Wing Commander series and all the work she's done for, for instance, Microsoft, Electronic Arts, and uh, Disney. Today, she is a senior lecturer at the DigiPen Institute of Technology, and she is a co-owner of Gizmocracy. And I know personally from first-hand accounts of friends and, and um, uh, uh, colleagues that I've had uh, how much Ellen has inspired game developers all around the world, and she's attending a lot of conferences to speak uh, from her experiences and all the work she's done. So we are truly honored to have her here today. So please help me welcome Ellen Beeman. Okay. Thank you, and, uh, and good afternoon. And I just want to say this is actually my first time in Sweden. And uh, yeah, I'm loving it. Beautiful country, and I'm so delighted that my Seattle weather followed me here, because who, who wants to see the sun anyhow? Um, in any case, I'm going to talk today about storytelling and story sense, what they are and why they are different, and there we go. Let's make sure this is working. <laughs> okay. Hang on one second here, slight technical difficulties. Anyhow, let me just talk while I am trying to figure out what is going on with this um, about just some of my experience and particularly, uh, this may wind up being very improv, <laughs> what I what I have done in video games over the last uh, 25 years. As Martin mentioned, um, I worked uh, at a number of companies. I've had the privilege of working on, um, sorry, one second here, titles for uh, a ridiculous number of companies when you actually get down to it. The, uh, the ones that I'm the most proud of that I am hoping to talk to you about, if I can, get this working, is, um, yeah, specifically some of my work on the Wing Commander series, and yay, there we go, all right. So um, let me just begin by talking a little bit about why I differentiate between storytelling and story sense. Um, storytelling, it, my work as a novelist and my work in television, um, that's, that's where I started, actually. I wrote for, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell some of these names. I worked on shows like My Little Pony and Gem and the Holograms. Anybody truly outrageous? Okay. Um, don't go see the movie, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, in any case, that, that really taught me a lot about structure and dramatic arcs and how to, how to build an emotionally resonant story. The... Um, the challenge, though, is not long after I left television, I started working in games, and I realized you can't do, you, I mean, you can try to do that, but ultimately the point of a game is the player is telling their own story, and you want to come up with ways to encourage them in that. Um, so in a traditional story, you have what I would call the A and B storylines, A being the action storyline, um, and B is the character development. This is why we actually care what happens. Uh, it's very, if you, if you start analyzing in particular, I'm a big fan, <laughs> having worked on multiple projects with Marvel, of the Marvel superhero movies, you can see how they, how they weave this part in, these two kinds of stories, what makes you care about the story, the characters, and what makes the story move forward. Um, and this, is, and this is a good thing. Uh, you can look at it and go, oh, this is very structural. But the reality is, ever since we started telling stories around, you know, campfires in, in you know, 
prehistoric days, um, we have looked for this. There's something about these stories that, um, that the, the ones, the classic stories you come back to, things like if you're not familiar with the hero's journey, which actually you are familiar with it, you may not know, um, Star Wars is almost line for line the Campbellian heroic journey. Um, the same thing with the original Matrix movie. These are very profound, very emotional uh, stories for us. Um, but yeah, in games, if we do not give the player agency, that we lose their engagement. That's, that's just a fundamental principle here. Um, so some of the things that, <laughs> things that I have done in my career that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't um, is branching storylines, which, you know, it can, it can work. I don't want to discourage anybody from, from doing that, but uh, you can, it, it can make the, fa the player feel very constrained in their choices. Um, linear, again, you're taking away agency from the player. You're potentially reducing engagement. Um, so what I have taken to doing in a bunch of my projects, uh, I call this story sense, and it's the idea of we're not actually telling the story, we are giving the player the opportunity to discover the story on their own. This is, in, in many ways, I think, you know, I feel, obviously I feel strongly about it because I'm up here standing here talking about it, um, but to me, this builds engagement because you are, you are, again, giving that player agency, they are looking around, and some players may run through your game and not discover any of these elements, and others will. So, another thing that, just to revert back to, um, to the old Wing Commander days, um, this was actually a really interesting thing that happened with that series. I joined Origin, uh, I think it was actually the week before they shipped Wing Commander 1. So I did not work on Wing Commander 1. I came in and immediately started working on Wing Commander 2, which I must describe as the best project in my career ever. Wing Commander 2, we won multiple Game of the Year awards, and I found my husband. So, <laughs> awesome, 22 years married. Uh, <laughs> but when I started working on the Wing Commander series, and they brought me in because of my television experience, because I know how to tell stories that really connect to the player, um, I started going through Wing Commander 1, and I had all the scripts, and was just you know, running through, you know, seeing, seeing how the game worked, learning my first scripting language. Uh, and I discovered something, which was there wasn't a lot of actual character stories. There were characters telling you things that were going on, but they didn't actually have stories of their own. It's just like, hi, I'm another pilot, let me tell you about this. And then I went to the forums, and I started reading what the players were saying about the game. And I got to this one group of, of, of players, and they were talking about this character, Angel, who's another pilot, and they were, they were saying things, and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I can tell how much she likes my character, I think she wants to date me, she's, she, she's, she's interested in me and all of this, and then I'm like, you know, really, tell me more, and they're like, oh yeah, there was that scene when she was talking to me, and I could just tell from what she was saying that, you know, there's a possibility of romance there, and I go back to the scripts, and I'm reading the scripts, she's saying, okay, when you're going against this particular kind of alien fighter, use this missile, because this one will work better, and you want to be careful, because your shields won't work as well. There's nothing to do with it, nothing. And so that was when I realized if we do not give the players stories, they will find them on their own. They will make them on their own. And so we actually, on the basis of player feedback on the forums, turned Angel into the love interest for Wing Commander 2. Um, Another thing I just want to say to all of you who want to do, uh, to be game writers, uh, and this is again me coming out of the novel world where 100,000 words, it's like, oh, I'm just getting started. <laughs> or the television world where I'm writing for, you know, 44 minutes or 22 minutes of on-screen dialogue, um, you have to be brief. There is something about the computer game interaction and how we read on the computer that um, you really, really, really want to keep it tight. Uh, in particular, when you start writing this stuff, as I did with Wing Commander 2, I was like, 
I'm going to write out this amazing love story and all of the, these other stories. Um, yeah, then I cut it in half and I cut it in half and I, I think I cut it in half a third time um, because very little, these broad strokes, very little goes a long ways. Um, so this is something that, uh, again, when I talk about story sense and dialogue and doing a lot with very little, um, you wanna just give, if you can just give an impression of who a character is, they will paint, the players will paint the rest of the picture for you. Um, and specifically, um, this was a character that, that I liked a lot uh, in Wing Commander 2. Um, you just, you basically just established her. She was, she was kind of like your kid sister. She was friendly, she helped you out, she, you know, you had come in in a very bad situation, she was trying to help you get through it, and just, you know, just a great character. Very, very small amount of dialogue to establish her. Um, so yeah, she's your kid sister, she's adorable, she's great. And then we killed her, yay! So, this is the point. <laughs> you don't have to be George R.R. R. Martin, <laughs> but <laughs> we, did this, we did this deliberately. We wanted to make it clear in this game that the stakes were high. People were going to die. We actually got, I got, I got hate mail on this. I, I would say I felt terrible. I think at the time I did feel terrible, but, um, but yeah, it was just, we, we had to establish the, the seriousness of the situation and this poor character was how we did it. Um, yeah, they were upset. <laughs> and that, when I talk about emotional resonance, that phrase, that's why I'm, I'm giving you this example, that's how you get there, is you create a character, and again, tiny, tiny little paintbrush strokes, and then people care about them, and then things happen to them. Um, who here really felt bad about that companion cube? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't much of a character, was it? <laughs> it really wasn't. Um, but you cared. Uh, you cared a lot. And that is, that is one of the things that I think we can do in games um, really elegantly. Where in movies and television, you know, they, they kind of have to hit you sometimes over the head with it, is we can take these small things and turn them into something much more. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, for someone who did the first video game with storytelling cutscenes, I'm not recommending doing a lot of them. Uh, this is one of those things that, again, any moment you're taking agency away from the player, uh, you wanna just think about it. Now, there are tons and tons of games with awesome cutscenes. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're, what you're doing is worth the risk you're taking of your player potentially disengaging. So, on to the subject of story sense. This is basically um, what I would love for you to consider in the projects that you're working on, which is instead of telling this, this linear or per perhaps you know, branching um, static storyline, you are creating things in the world that carry the story. Uh, an example would be, well actually, I think I can give you some examples here. Um, here's, again, I, I love talking about Wing Commander, very beginning of my career, uh, and since then I've worked on many, many great titles, but I, I, we were figuring out a lot of this stuff. So, um, Wing Commander, this was one of the add-ons, and this was back in the day when you had to have printed materials to use for copy protection. Thank you, digital downloads. We don't have to do things like that anymore. Um, but we made the printed materials for this were visit scenic Goddard colony. And it was, it was, a little, it was this little tour guide <laughs> thing, the little pamphlet that we included in the game telling you all about this gorgeous colony and how they're, you know, it's a wonderful tourist destination. This is all great. And then the first thing we did in the game was blow it up. So <laughs> I know you're sensing a theme here with me, I suspect. But, um, it is, it is definitely the, the idea here, and this was, this was a very successful from the viewpoint of the players, was we had set the scene of here is this wonderful planet, and now here's, here are the stakes. Here is, here is what at stake. Um, this is your job to stop this from happening again. 
Um, so I'm going to just give some examples here. The, uh, a horror game in particular, when my students at DigiPen do horror games, I'm always so excited because, you know, death and destruction. Scariness, one of, some of my favorite things, but in any case, um, it's a particularly great genre if you just want to think about how you might implement something like this in any game genre. This is something that I would suggest thinking about, that it's a, um, it's a particularly good genre for these little touches of things that could make the, the experience more, more visceral, more emotional, hit that, hit that emotional core. Um, some of the uh, student games from DigiPen that have done really well in this, there was, uh, there was one with the, the giant bugs <laughs> that was really, really scary. The first time you see these bugs, and they're you know as big as this carpet, basically, um, the first time you see them, it's just a quick glimpse. Oh, was that even something there? You hear a little skittering sound, or a little clicking, things like that. And then you start to realize what you are up against. Very subtle, subtle, subtle things like that. Um, but yeah, and when you're thinking about this, do think in terms of all the different ways you could do it. One of the very effective student games um, that one of my teams did, they had, it was a, the horror game concept where you're trapped in this, in this dark office environment uh, with a monster. And you never actually see the monster, and that's actually an important point um, if, you, if you do decide to work in the horror genre, is a lot of times the reveal of the monster is the worst moment in the game. You want to be careful to avoid that. But what they had was just scrawled notes on the walls. And apparently the people who had been in this building before had gone kind of crazy, and so the notes didn't always make sense, but they were always kind of terrifying. Um, and yeah, claw marks, things like that. So if you're doing an adventure game, um, these, are, these are some great, some great ideas of what you could do with it. Uh, the, the fun with something like this, another student game that I'm thinking of, they just had, uh, you know, it was a journal that had been destroyed and there were bits and pieces of it around. So if you wanted to go right in and engage with the, um, the adventure, which was solving this mysterious series of glyphs so that you could escape alive, um, you could just do that. Or if you were interested, you could start, you know, digging in, take some time, learn more about this. Um, so yeah, basically the, I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make here is it doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot to, uh, to have a really, really strong impact on your players. It does take a lot of thoughtfulness, and again, just trying to think what, is, what are the emotions that you are trying to create in your player, um, what, what kind of responses do you want them to have at different times, the, you know, the, the killing of that character spirit in Wing Commander 2, the response we wanted and we did succeed in is, okay, now I have to go fight. This, this war is now real for me. Uh, I have to go do this. Um, in in these in the the Goddard Colony mission, it's I have you know the I have to stop this from happening again. It's it's the the players stepping up both in terms of the actions they're going to take in the game, but also emotionally, and yeah, the cake. <laughs> so I went awfully fast in the hopes of getting some questions, and so I would love to. I would love to see if people, either questions about, and I'm gonna have to sort of look here to see who's, who's raising their hand. Um, yeah, please. Good, just in time for the actual question. Yes. What are your tools to make sure that, um, that a character which is pivotal to your game uh, isn't misunderstood? 
as having another agenda than they have or, or uh, to drive the player in the wrong direction, so to okay. say. Okay. So that is a, the great question about how, how do I make sure that a pivotal character isn't misunderstood? It is the same way, and boy, do my students hear me talk about this over and over again. It is the same way you test anything else in a game is you put it in front of human beings who are not on your game team and you see how they react. Um, I am a huge, huge, huge advocate for, for user testing. Um, I basically feel that, well, <laughs> okay. In, in my game class back in Seattle, uh, designers who don't do user testing will fail the class. That's how strongly I feel about it. You can, you can test game mechanics, you can test your user interface, you can absolutely test your story, and I do. And in some respects, it's actually one of the potentially easier things to test. Um, there's a game, um, Spycross, that I put out on mobile a few years back, and I'm going to port to, to, to Unity sometime soon. Um, the, the story was done in very short snippets, and I could absolutely just run those past people and, and see how they reacted to it. Um, the big thing I do want to talk about, though, is because you're, you're talking as a group of designers, um, there is this very, very real phenomenon that I call playtester's disease. And I am guilty of it. <laughs> all, all of us are. And that is once you know what the game is, you are no longer a valid tester. Uh, this is especially true for things like difficulty testing. I'm still embarrassed by there's a Wing Commander 2 mission that went out that the QA department was like, oh, Ellen, you, you, did, this, you did this massive space battle with you know, dozens of ships and all this, and it's, it's a magnificent battle, but it's too easy. And I'm like, I can fix that. And I ramped it up and ramped it up. And the QA department was like, yes, now it's actually challenging for us. Completely and utterly wrong. I, I still regret that 20 years later because I then created a mission that was challenging for the QA department who play this game 40 to 50 hours a week. <laughs> this was wrong. So um, just keep in mind that uh, you do become biased. And, and you will not be able to see, for example, user interface is a great example of this, as a story. You know what's going on. You're not going to see where the problems are. Um, I will add in my rant about playtesting <laughs> that the other thing I strongly recommend, um, I mentioned in, in the panel just previously, uh, that I was a Girl Scout troop leader for half a dozen years. Kids are the best testers ever. And there's a reason for it. It's not their reflexes, it's not their intellectual insights or anything like this. It's that when they're under the age of 12, they haven't learned how to be polite. So they will tell you, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and that's awesome, it is awesome. So uh, I recommend recruiting uh, children, uh, assuming your content is, is child, child appropriate, I would recommend testing your content with younger players as well. Um, other? Okay, do you have the mic? Yeah, I do. Uh, okay, but speak loud because I still can't. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, maybe if you could uh, speak a bit about uh, the different phases that you go through when you produce uh, the initial narrative. Is it like a manuscript or do you, do, oh. do you use a hybrid text system or and yeah, so, stuff like that? How, how do you go about that? So, um, I started doing narrative back when we didn't have Microsoft Word even. <laughs> so uh, I used whatever tools were available and, uh, and did the best that I could. Um, these days there are some fantastic tools available. Uh, if you're going to do something with branching storylines, I recommend uh, Twine or Ink. Uh, are some great systems out there. Honestly, what, what I did and what I've done even on most recent projects is I think faster in scripting language than just about anything else. And so I will tend to, um, write, I will tend to write my narrative while simultaneously wrapping it in the scripting language stuff that lets me test it, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Um, I do want to talk though, not just about tools, but about the process. Uh, there is something that I do that I do recommend for for your storytelling in games, and that's I always start with what I think are the most emotionally resonant scenes 
in the work. And I've done that whether it's a novel or a television script or a game. I come up with, you know, the moment you find out that the prince's guardian has actually betrayed him was one story I did, I did way back. Um, the moment you find out that the, the cavalry isn't coming, <laughs> that you are on your own and you have to somehow get through this situation. Uh, things like that. I try to pick out those scenes and, um, and I write those first. Because if, if I'm doing something and I want that emotional resonance, I really want to do my best so that people care about these characters and what's happening to them, those are my big test cases. Uh, do those actually work? Um, I will say that uh, it also, if I don't feel it, you won't feel it. Um, there's, a, there's a very strange project that I've been working on that, that's almost done, which is um, about uh, three, three demons in hell. And the ending, it's all about their friendship and the fact, the fact that demons, demons shouldn't have friends, so their friendship is wrong. Uh, and if I don't feel that like, you know, oh, the, the tug at the heartstring for those moments, for those characters, I just have to presume you won't either. Uh, you cannot just dial this in. Uh, you know, if, the, if, if I want the reader to cry, I should cry. If I want the reader to laugh, I should laugh. If I'm not crying and I'm not laughing, I'm probably doing it wrong. Um, but yeah, to answer your actual question though, tons and tons and tons of great tools available that I wish had been available 20 years ago. Um, uh, I think we can uh, Like, do one more? One more. Okay, one more question. Uh, oh, somebody over here? I just had the simple question of, um, how, would I, how would I put it? If you could choose one game's storytelling to like, what would you say is your favorite game's storytelling? Or wait, your favorite game's story ever, if you could explain it, oh. and like why. If you could just make an example of like, this like, game's like this, story this got game to me. For, or this game for, for just the purity of the storytelling? Well, not, not, okay, fine. Um, what is a good game's, like, an example of a good story? Well, actually, I'm, I, I chose one as my closing image. Uh, I loved, I lo you know, and again, it was pretty, fairly subtly done. Uh, the first Portal game, what they did with the storytelling in that. Um, but you cared. You cared a great deal. And there was this, this wonderful twist at the end that made you sort of stop and think about it. And of course, Jonathan Colton's beautiful song to go with it. Uh, and I think that's, that, that is an example of what I look for in games is I, you know, and I hope all of you create games like this. I look for games that make me feel something and make me stop and think about it. Uh, and, and both, not just, you know, I'm not just playing through some action sequence. There is, there is something deeper going on. There is a connection to me from the designer of the game. So, okay, I guess we're, we're at time. All right, well, thank you all very much.